Welcome to In Business, part of the podcast called Peter Day's World of Business. In this edition, more about a new way of raising money by asking complete strangers over the internet. Peter Day explains. These are tough times, especially for people who want to start a new business. Banks seem reluctant to lend. Customers want to keep money in their pockets. But bad times may be good times to start something new. Listen to Eric Mijakovsky. He invented a watch called the Pebble. It displays smartphone messages as well as the time. He raised money, quite a lot of it, on an American website called Kickstarter. We expected to raise $100,000 on Kickstarter in about a month. That was our goal. I think we hit 100000 in the first two hours. We received a million dollars in funding in the first 28 hours, and uh, after 30 days we had raised $10.2 million. Adrian Hon is another veteran of this new practice called crowdfunding. He used it for his British computer games company, Six to Start. There are lots of different ways you can get funding these days. You can try and get a loan from the bank, although that probably won't work for anyone. Um, you can try and get venture capital funding, like they do in Silicon Valley. You can try and get grants. You'd thought about these things and rejected them. We, we rejected them, and we instead considered a new route, which is called crowdfunding. It's not just for high-tech businesses, this crowdfunding. Here's a man who wants to teach bicycle riders how to build their own bikes. My name's Andrew Denham. I'm the director of the Bicycle Academy. I wanted to build a frame for a bicycle race that I organise. And I realised that most of the frame building courses are quite expensive. But also that you get to build one frame on the course, but that's it. There's no way of going back and continuing. And that's something that I really wanted to do. So I decided to create something with a format that suited me. And it turns out that lots of people thought the same way. And you need some money to get set up. I realised very early on that this wasn't going to be cheap. So I decided that actually the best way forward would be to look at crowdfunding. How much money? Originally £20,000, but then... that by uh, rent of premises and things? Yeah, essentially that and the equipment that we needed. I then realised that to do this properly, we needed to double that. So we needed to raise £40,000. Although that's not an enormous amount of money to start a business, it's a lot of money to ask other people for. And it's more than you had? An awful lot more than I had, yes. Andrew Denham is based in the Somerset market town of Froome, which turns out to be a neat little nest of creative businesses. He says it's an exhilarating experience watching the money come in. We went live on the 1st of November 2011. We had six weeks within which we needed to raise the £40,000. And it's important to say that had we not raised the full amount within the six weeks, we would have received none of the money. So it was an all-or-nothing situation. Now, you put it up... You've done some prep work, you've started talking about it as loudly as you possibly can, so this is not quite out of the blue, but to many internet users it would be. What happens? We actually raised all of the money within six days. That must be an extraordinary feeling. This is entrepreneurship with a wow factor attached to it right at the very beginning. You've hardly pitched and people are waving cheques in the air. And what was wonderful is that, of course, everybody involved could see what I could see. So they were all as excited. It gained a hell of a momentum because people were trying to encourage their friends to, to back the project. Everybody was excited. It was wonderful. And a keen sense of biking community emerges from the money raising. What we've created is 183 evangelists of the Bicycle Academy. Every single one of them are are part of it. They know that without their involvement, we wouldn't have done it. They help promote us, they help support us, and, and that's invaluable. I'm Chris, Chris Vernon. Where from? Uh, I live in Bristol at the moment. And a cycling freak? I wouldn't say a freak, but yes, I do enjoy my cycling. I have to say I was one of the eager beavers checking out the website every day. I was one of the early backers just because I had the money there and I I thought that this would be a very useful project to engage with at at the earlier stage. How much money? I think it was £400 I put in in the beginning, yeah. And you uh, were essentially buying yourself an early place on the course, weren't you? But also, I really wanted to see it happen. So I was very keen to put my money in and encourage others to do so and and spread the word myself. What's it like? It's absolutely fantastic. The room is beautiful. It's not just a dingy workshop. There's artwork on the wall. It's a very light, airy environment. I have a small burn to my thumb already. So all my expectations have been met. 
Various kinds of internet-enabled funding are emerging, as Daniel Eisenberg explains. He's a serial entrepreneur, also an entrepreneur professor at Babson College in Massachusetts. There are different types of crowdfunding. There's donation crowdfunding. There's kind of like reward or product crowdfunding. We get you put money up and you get a sample off the production line if the thing rolls. Exactly. And then there's equity crowdfunding, which is new, and that's selling shares in a crowdfunding way. And it seems that Britain is an early mover in selling shares on the Internet the crowdfunding way. The USA has several well-known project funding websites, but equity crowdfunding has only recently been legalised there by the JOBS Act. It stands for Jumpstart Our Business Startups. The American financial regulators are still deciding how to implement it. So British fundraising businesses such as Crowdcube, based in Exeter, are gaining experience that the Americans don't yet have. Crowdcube's chief executive is Darren Westlake. I'm an entrepreneur, a frustrated entrepreneur, and I've, I've started and exited two businesses now. Really, I saw this uh, this huge need for, for finance, and my, my own need was one of many. And I really thought there must be another way that people could raise finance for, for businesses. The process is really quite simple. I mean, it's, it's like any other funding source. They need to provide us with a business plan and financial forecasts, and we'll go through those and make sure that they're up to the standard before we would let them publish their business on the website. Here we are with the website in front of us. So up comes the front page, right? What's it look like? So on the front page of the website, we have uh, a number of different pitches, so um, some some logos of the different businesses we have, and a brief brief explanation about each of the businesses, what they do, how much money they're looking for, and the progress they've made so far in raising their finance. So this is all about the companies you're raising money for at the moment? Absolutely, yeah. So there's a list of businesses that are looking to raise money. And then I click through if I'm interested in a particular business, yes? Yeah, click on the business of interest, read up on it, understand the business, ask questions if you need to, and then when you feel comfortable and if you wish to, then you can actually go through the process of investing. Right, okay, so you vet, or you see that the pitch is okay, Uh, I put it up on the site and then pay some kind of fee, or I'm prepared to pay some kind of fee. What's the arrangement? Yeah, so we only charge if you're successful in raising money. Um, We charge 5% of of the money raised, but if you you don't raise the money, we don't charge you anything. To take equity stakes in a startup business. This is a high-risk thing you're asking people to do, isn't it? It is a high-risk thing, absolutely. I mean, these businesses, um, you know, m- many of them will fail. Um, some of them will be successful. Um, and, and again, it comes back to having that information in front of you to try and make an informed decision of which one will be the star and which one may not be so, so successful. Because presumably the health warning for the investor mm-hmm. is don't put too much money into a single company. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the, tip, the average investment we've had through the site so far has been about £1,600. What we're trying to do is enable people to build a diversified portfolio of, of investments and spread their risk, because if there is high risk, the best way to deal with that is to diversify and, and spread your risk. Now to a brand new name from a new company born on a London kitchen table that's financed its development using the crowd. What you see on the front of this pack is immediately what you get. You get bursts of ginger, bursts of sesame. I can like smell it uh, before you yes, even you pour it this. out. Yes, you're going to put a little in there, and then I dip lettuce in it, do I? Yes, so think of it as a... You get a nice bit of lettuce, and then... So this is our Asian-inspired um, dressing. So you get um, immediate uh, bursts of sesame complemented by subtle, the subtle heat of ginger. It's a business funded using Crowdcube, righteous all-natural salad dressings created by Jem Misa. Born in the Philippines, now based in her flat in West London, she gained high-level international marketing experience with the global consumer goods giant Unilever but she eventually wanted to do something for herself. Jem Misa spent a year testing recipes and finding suppliers and getting a few supermarket clients, but then she realised she needed something else. When Righteous ended up on supermarket shelves and we realised that we needed to change our game plan, we couldn't do slow organic growth anymore, we needed to tell more people about the product, I realized that we needed a big advertising campaign and there was no way that I was going to be able to fund that myself. 
other options we looked at were bank loans. Now, the problem with that was because the company was only two years old, didn't have much credit history, the amount that we could actually borrow wasn't enough for what we had planned. And also the interest rates weren't ideal. How much did you want? We were looking for £75,000. And you were offering a stake in the company for that money. Yes. So I was thinking it was more friends and family that were going to be participating. But I was so amazed that people have heard about the brand and wanted to be able to be part of it. So we were able to get 85 fantastic investors. They believe in the ethos, the values behind the company, and they just wanted to see it succeed. And also when people are watching the business and they start seeing that of the funds, 15%, 20% have been committed, then there's a certain panic that they want to be part of it, that it, it, we found almost like a landslide of investment come in at a very short time. Righteous salad dressings. Salads just got sexy, naturally. Much to my surprise, if you know what you're doing, it's now possible to finance the making of a TV commercial and the showing of it on digital TV channels for quite a modest amount of money. £75,000 isn't much when you think about it, but it was enough for us to create an ad that made a statement about the company showing the level of quality of products that we offer and really making us not really just a kitchen counter brand in people's eyes. And I think that's, that's what we needed. There is something else extremely interesting about crowdfunding, and that is trust. 85 people are putting an awful lot of trust, not just on a concept or a company, but on you personally, sole employee. Yes, yes. Um, And I think that was a very big part of my pitch as well when I presented this project on Crowdcube in terms of investment, they are just as much invested, not in the idea, but in myself. I just made sure they knew that I did have a very solid background in marketing. And in terms of being an entrepreneur, I've had a successful salad company in the Philippines, which in terms of experience, sort of helped them feel more secure about investing in me. Jen Misa got the money, she had the commercial made in the Philippines and shown in Britain. So where has Righteous got to now? While the ad was running, we also ran a supermarket promotion, which incentivized trial, but the combination of the two cost us to increase our sales by 300%. The ad has just finished. What we're hoping for now is that we get the retention rate that we're hoping for. So fingers crossed, it happens. (laughs) Jem Misa of Righteous Salad Dressings. And even at this embryo stage of crowdfunding, there are quite a lot of eye-catching success stories. But what about the would-be startups who fail to attract investors? I got a rundown on some of the figures from Darren Westlake of the funding site Crowdcube. How much money have you raised so far? We've raised £3.8 million in the 18 months that we've been going. That's for 23 different businesses so far. How many have failed to raise the money? So about 10% are actually successful in raising the money through the site. So there's quite a, uh, a large sort of wastage here. People fail to attract investors' attention with the proposition on the site. Absolutely, yeah. And we think that's the way it should be. You know, we try to give investors a good choice of businesses to invest in, and only the best ones will succeed. And that's the way that the crowd and the wisdom of the crowd should work. Are there particular things that seem to work? People invest in things that they can understand and that they know to some degree. So we've had a lot of success in consumer products that have been in supermarkets. For instance, Gem from Righteous, she had a salad uh, dressing. So she had that as a product. And people can understand those. They're very simple. So she'd had a, uh, a big company background, of course. So they could tick that on the CV. Then there was a product which they could actually buy and test because it was in nationally distributed supermarkets. So that ticked a lot of boxes for your kind of investor. Absolutely, yeah. And and we've had a few kind of scientific and more complicated type businesses on the site. And and people just don't understand them. If you don't understand them, you're probably not going to back them because you can't feel confident in your investment. What about the other 90%? Are they duff businesses or do they need to reshape and repitch? Because it must be a bruising experience when you put yourself up for (laughs) recognition and money and you don't get either. They probably need to have a look at and, and try and understand why they weren't successful. Was it because they didn't have the right kind of collateral? They didn't have the, the decent business plan? Was it because they're just not a consumer kind of product and therefore crowds don't really understand it? Yet. Yet, yes. Or is it there's just something fundamentally wrong with their business and they're probably not going to be a success? 
individual failures, but there are also sceptics who think that buying shares via crowdfunding is not an investment strategy that can work. Professor Daniel Eisenberg of Babson College is one of them. Equity-based crowdfunding has no place in the overall portfolio. And the reason I'm against it is I think inherently it has to be unfair to the investor. The investor inherently, intrinsically, will have to lose money. Why? But, Why have to? Because when it comes to equity markets, crowds are notoriously not smart. They're not wise. People talk about the wisdom of crowds, and that's true when you want to rate a restaurant. And you sort of you go out there and say, what do thousands of people think about this restaurant or book or movie? That makes a lot of sense. But the only way you can make money buying equity is by buying low and selling high. That means you have to see an asset that the market thinks is not valuable, and you have to buy that thinking that it will become valuable. You have to go against the market in order to make money as as an equity investor. The smart investors are going to be the ones staying out of equity crowdfunding, and so who's left? But crowdfunding is still an intriguing idea, and very interesting projects and businesses founded on projects are coming out of it. The biggest money raiser on the American side Kickstarter was that Pebble Watch, devised by Eric Majikowski. It's a watch that you can connect by Bluetooth, and you can get messages, emails, calls, and you can even change music tracks. And the biggest thing that we brought to the table with this new watch was you can actually install applications. We had originally gone out and tried to raise about uh, $1.5 million from venture capitalists and angel investors. The process for failing to raise money from venture capitalists and angels took a month. I can't imagine how long it would have taken to succeed. We expected to raise $100,000 on Kickstarter in about a month. That was our goal. I think we hit 100000 in the first two hours. We received a million dollars in funding in the first 28 hours, and after 30 days we had raised $10.2 million. For any startup, really, the ultimate goal is to make something that people want. If you don't make something that people want, then you won't raise money, you won't be able to make any sales. And what we've shown, I mean, it was our goal to, to make something that people want, and I think we've, uh, we've started to show that that's what we're doing using Kickstarter. The Pebble was using the business model of raising money to get things done from payment in advance for goods to be received later. And I have to report that delivery of the watch to backers has now slipped. It won't be available as originally planned in September. Eric Majikowski is another of those sceptical about selling stakes in a startup company using equity crowdfunding. With equity-based crowdfunding, you're kind of just getting back into the same investor groove where instead of impressing customers and building something for customers, you're trying to impress investors, which are sometimes customers, but most of the time just people that are interested in you know, a return on investment instead of a return on product. So if you ever run into investors who are going to be customers as well, why not just make them customers to start with? Eric Mijakowski of Pebble. Another of the new British take a stake in the company crowdfunding websites is Cedars, spelt with an S. Its co-founder is the American Jeff Lynn, now based in London. One of the things that we feel very strongly is that the traditional type of crowdfunding, the so-called Kickstarter model, is fantastic in two sets of circumstances. If it is a creative project that has very little prospect of profitability, then donating to it without any real return is absolutely fine. And likewise, if you are getting a tangible reward, a watch, as was one of the big ones on Kickstarter, that works too. But what you don't want, what a person providing funding doesn't want to do is be the person who kick-started Mark Zuckerberg. They don't want to have given Mark $500 and said, good luck with this Facebook thing, and then find Mark a billionaire and got nothing to show out of it. Well, they might have got a bit of kudos or something like that. Or to get Facebook up and running just because they like the idea of the project. Don't discolour it too much because you missed out on a fortune. (laughs) I don't 100% agree. I think that, you know, if you look at Kickstarter and Indiegogo and the other businesses, they started almost entirely based on creative and artistic projects. Entrepreneurs have come to them because until now, equity-based crowdfunding hasn't been available. We think that as we and other models out there that provide the opportunity for investors to get upside proliferate, what we will see is people who allocate capital will not want to give it away to a business that has the prospect of of serious profit when they can participate in the upside.
What about that idea that equity crowdfunding can't really deliver investment profits because investors need to beat the crowd to win, not be part of it? Jeff Lynn disagrees. I don't think you're trying to beat the market here. I think that you're trying to build a portfolio of investments. What we've seen from the data, and this is angel investing, it's slightly later stage, but what we've seen from the data is that in Britain, average internal rate of return, IRR, on angel investments has historically been 22%. We're not that seeing... includes all the duds. Not that just the ones that, we're not just talking no, about the ones that succeed. Absolutely. About 80% of those returns came from 9% of the businesses. And so for the most part, what we're encouraging investors to do is to try to build a portfolio, not to beat any market, but to gain the returns that are available in this asset class. The other key point, the difference between this and the public equity markets in particular, is that you don't have high frequency or any frequency trading. These are long-term investments. I agree that crowds do tend to jump. And Actually, that doesn't happen here. This is a one-time decision based on a one-time valuation, and I think that the crowds will do an excellent job of making that kind of a decision. But there's another factor at play, maybe the secret source in startup investing at the moment. The British government is currently giving great big tax allowances for investing in small firms. Darren Westlake of the funding internet site Crowdcube explains. There's huge tax breaks, and there's always been uh, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, which has been a, a 30% tax rebate. Uh, then I have the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, which is a 50% tax rebate. And the government also have a, a one-off offer, if you like, this year for people who've invested in other investments and withdraw those investments to invest in, a, in the SEIS, and they end up getting a 78% tax break. And the SEIS is... It's an investment operation for people who are investing in businesses who are looking to raise up to £150,000. So that means in total this year you can get a sort of rebate on your investment. You de-risk your investment by what percent? By 78%. The, all the investors we see coming through our site, the well, one thing that they're really demanding above and beyond you know, a great business is for those businesses to have these tax breaks. And I think out of the 23 businesses that we've funded, I think perhaps only two of them actually haven't had EIS or SEIS in place because that's what investors look for. What worries me about that is that it distorts the market. This is a, a tax thing, not an investment thing. I think it's designed to open people's eyes to the, the opportunities of investing in, in, in small companies, which you know the man on the street may not have normally thought about. I have another slightly sceptical feeling about all this, which I put to Jeff Lynn of Cedars. Basic objection to £10 minimum is that your poor, tiny companies are loading themselves with hideously complicated shareholder register from day one. Simply too complex to administer. One of the key parts of our model is that we hold the shares as nominee for the underlying investors. So that means that from a company's perspective, they only face us as legal shareholder. Hang on a minute. If the business really takes off, I want my 1% or 0.1% or whatever it is stake for me, don't I? You can, you can sell it off at a premature stage on my behalf, willy-nilly. We, can't, we do not make buy-sell decisions. That's the one thing we won't do. I suppose the question anybody would ask about a startup like you, as well as the startups that are on the site, is why are they going this way to get finance? Initial suspicion about a new thing. thing. I think there are two key points. One is that first fifty, seventy-five hundred thousand pounds of capital. Unless you come from a rich family or you've worked in the city for 15 years and have saved up bonuses, that capital isn't available in too many places. I mean, people talk about the banks not lending. The banks never lent to businesses at that stage, and angels and venture capitalists don't invest there either. The the other point that I would say is what many of these businesses see is that the prospect of having, say, two or 300 people, having voted with their wallets that they think this is a good business, have a vested interest in the business's success and will be out there promoting it, providing support, connections, advice, is a big advantage. Rather than having one old angel who maybe sold a pub chain 15 years ago and that's how he got his money, here you get a big base of supporters to help you. That puts the spotlight on something which is an extremely interesting component of the way angels tell their side of the story, and that is their involvement with companies, the mentoring side of things. Very experienced business people, and these startups can do with that. Doesn't happen in your sort of thing. Oh, well, but it does, and it happens even better. Because first of all, you're not just getting the advice and mentorship and support from one or two angels who happen to give you capital. You're getting it from two or three hundred. And there are already satisfied customers of crowdfunding. One of them is Adrian Hahn of the computer games company Six to Start. The amount that we needed was 
you know, it, it wasn't a massive amount. Um, and there are lots of different ways you can get funding these days. You can try and get a loan from the bank, although that probably won't work for anyone. Um, you can try and get venture capital funding like they do in Silicon Valley. You can try and get grants. And they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that they all actually take quite a lot of time. And of course, there's a cost. You're obviously giving up equity for the money that you get. So you'd thought about these things and rejected them? We, we rejected them and we instead considered a new route. For the first couple of days, it was people who we knew mostly. And then at, I think on the third day, it, it sort of um, went viral, as they say. Uh, it sort of started splitting over Twitter, over the weblogs and so on. And we got you know, $20,000 in a single day. And from that point on, press started getting interested. And so we had we had newspapers and, and so on calling us up. And of course, this is twofold exciting, isn't it? It's you getting the money to do this, but you getting signals from the outside world that, that what you're working on is interesting and probably has a potential and, customer base. And, and, it's, it's, it's a kind of double whammy. Exactly. That, that is probably just as important if not more important than the actual money that you get that it's a proof that the product you're making actually has an audience and has a market supporters can also bring insights to the nitty-gritty of developing the game the commentator naomi alderman helped adrian hon create the story for the game called zombies run it's where joggers use their mobile phones to enable them to be chased by computerized zombies you also can't underestimate the effect of having 3,500 advocates for your product out there. And they're helping us make the product. So, for example, when I was writing, I needed to, the help of someone who had a military background to answer some questions. We had mil- people in, from, amongst our backers who had a military background who had emailed us to say, if you need any help, contact me. Some so, of the zombies uh, helped you, no doubt, as well. <laughs> yeah. I, you got some grunts. A lot of my best friends are zombies. Oh, right, yeah. And at Froome at the Bicycle Academy, Andrew Denham is excited to be up and running after selling Academy Bike Frame building courses to the internet crowd. We've pre-sold 75 course places and we have a few hundred people on our waiting list. So it looks as though this is a goer, does it? Yeah, I think so. And you actually couldn't have done it without crowdfunding. No, absolutely. I I think it would have been very, very difficult to do it without crowdfunding. I know of people in London who've tried to go the conventional route and have failed, that banks have turned them down. You know, it's very difficult at the moment to raise finance. And by opening that up to the people who would be partaking in the courses, we've been able to do it. A final cautionary question to Jeff Lynn of Cedars in London. There's a big cross fingers about this. This is stepping into quite a big unknown, what you're doing, isn't it? Absolutely. We are, we think we have invented a new form of finance and there is absolutely a a great deal of unknown that's involved with that, but so are all exciting innovations. There's no time like a crisis to launch a disruptive idea and crowdfunding is only one of the ways that outsiders are trying to rethink the financing of small businesses. There'll be flops aplenty, of course, but maybe we'll also see some striking and sustainable successes among the businesses that cannot resist the roar of the crowd. Peter Day, the producer of the programme, was Mike Wendling. On our website, you can sign up for the podcast, find more information, and listen to archive editions. Just search for In Business on Radio 4, or visit the Radio 4 website and follow the links. This has been a podcast from the BBC. For more information, and for our terms and conditions, visit bbc.co.uk slash radio4.